Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming out on such a cold night. But it won't be a bitter night because today we're part of a gathering where we're taking a stand against oppression and in favor of liberation. And there is nothing bitter about that, or at least there need not be. So you can see basically the uh, plan for this evening. Last time, I provided something of a whirlwind tour of the animal ethics world in terms of analysis. And this time, we're going to look at that world in terms of criticism. And I'm going to explain a little bit about critical thinking and what it means in an academic sense. Um, uh, look at problems with intuitionism. Uh, we discussed a little bit about intuitions last time. And as you can see, there's the familiar theories by now from last week. Uh, rights, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, ethical egoism, pragmatism, ecoholism, feminist ethic of care. So uh, without further ado, why don't we begin? Critical thinking means that you're kind of standing back from views and arguments, and you're assessing them for strengths and weaknesses which is about what you would expect, um, I imagine, finding factors pro and con uh, with respect to different views. And uh, obviously the pro is uh, positive criticism. Actually, not everyone seems to realize that criticism can be positive, but it can. There's positive criticism and negative criticism as well. Um, I think it's important for the purposes of criticism to understand what it means to criticize. And in academics, it has, a, at its most serious anyway, it has a lot to do with arguments and how people approach arguments. So let's try to learn something or review something about arguments this evening. Uh, this is a standard example of a deductive argument. Uh, it's valid, and I'll explain what valid means uh, as we go. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That follows validly the conclusion. Um, and you can see the argument is expressed in what's called standard form, which means you have numbered premises and a numbered conclusion. Um, the premises are the first two statements. And um, the conclusion uh, is denoted there as well. Uh, Bertrand Russell would state the general form of this argument in a way that will be confusing for some of you, but it's there uh, to pert the attention of those who might be interested in the mathematical nature of logic. If all A's are B's and X is A, then X is B. If all men are mortal, B's and X, Socrates is A, that is a man, then X is B. Uh, Socrates is mortal as well. Um, it's fascinating how logic works, but we don't have a lot of time to really meditate on logic. Um, this is a bad deductive argument. This was a good one where the conclusion absolutely follows from the premises, and you would be contradicting yourself if you said that the premises are true, but then denied the conclusion. This, however, indicates mathematics at university is a very difficult subject. Harold is studying math at the University of Maryland. Therefore, Harold is having a difficult time studying mathematics at university. This is a bad, invalid argument. The conclusion does not follow from the premises. Uh, you can certainly assert the two premises and deny the conclusion uh, without any self-contradiction whatsoever. Um, really, this argument rests upon a confusion. Um, the reason why the uh, conclusion is not justified by the premises is that this argument trades on two different senses of math being difficult to study. In premise number one, math being difficult to study is about what the average person finds when they go to university to study math. 
premise too is about the level of difficulty that Harold has studying math at university. But Harold might be particularly adept in, at math and not find it uh, especially difficult. So the argument confuses two senses of difficulty and therefore comes to uh, an erroneous and illicit conclusion. So that's a deductive argument where if it's successful, you can't assert the premises and the conclusion, um, or sorry, assert the premises and deny the conclusion without contradicting yourself. This is a bad one where the opposite is true. And this is a different kind of argument. Deductive argument is uh, rather conceptual, and it's at the level of uh, abstract concepts. Uh, inductive argument, by contrast, is what's used in uh, science, uh, for the most part. Uh, science that has recourse to the facts uh, of the world through experience. And inductive arguments are very different. You don't have valid or invalid uh, inductive arguments. Uh, here with the uh, deductive argument, you talk about contradicting yourself if, uh, if uh, you deny the conclusion of one uh, that's valid. But with an inductive argument, it's not the same. You're talking about facts of the world, and you can only deal in probability, not certainty, 100% certainty, the way you can with this argument. So um, uh, this is um, an example of an inductive argument that's not very strong at all. We've been experiencing dramatic, weird weather, such as more dangerous hurricanes. Stronger hurricanes fit global warming theory. Therefore, global warming is occurring. Now, as it says in the note, it would be a much stronger argument if a more comprehensive list of characteristics for the global warming model were outlined, and it was a much longer argument, and effort was made to show that observations in the real world match up with that global warming model. Okay? So... Um, this is a, a whirlwind introduction to argument. This is a really weak induct inductive argument. I experienced the most severe storm I've ever uh, seen while on vacation. This event fits global warming theory. Therefore, global warming, that's happening. Well, that's very weak. It's an isolated observation. So um, um, before we get on to Kant, and um, Getting a little ahead of myself here. Um, in review, what is an argument in general? An argument is a series of statements where you have premises leading to a conclusion, either by deduction uh, or through induction. Um, so that's what an argument is. It's a series of statements where as a statement is something asserted in isolation, a statement can be true or false, but an argument, uh, we don't talk about the truth and falsehood of arguments. Um, we talk about the validity or invalidity of these uh, deductive arguments, okay? An argument is valid just in case the, c the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. That's a valid argument where, again, you can't assert the premises, deny the conclusion without self-contradiction. Um, and a strong inductive argument uh, is where the probability that's estimated is very high, and the judgment of probability is, is deemed credible, hopefully by the uh, scientific community. Um, so that's what an argument... What is a sound argument? A sound argument is different from... Uh, valid argument. In a valid argument, if you assert the premises, the conclusion has to follow. But a sound argument is even more precious. Because in a sound argument, not only does the conclusion necessarily follow, but the premises are true in a sound argument. So you can be absolutely sure of the conclusion of a sound argument, because it follows deductively from the premises, and the premises are true. You can have nonsense deductive arguments using Russell's formula that don't make any sense, but they're valid because uh, the conclusion would follow from the premises. You could um, talk about uh, 
you know, you can talk about galumpha gumps instead of men, and you can talk about the characteristics uh, of uh, of yellow uh, violin sound synesthesia as the characteristic. You could have anything, any noun, any characteristic. It could be something out of Alice in Wonderland, and validity or invalidity would still apply. But we get rid of that nonsensical offensiveness when we look for sound arguments, because then the uh, pr the statements of the premises have to be true. So people hear the word fallacy, and very often they don't have any idea what it means. A fallacy is different from a falsehood. A fallacy is any case where someone uh, interprets a conclusion invalidly from a set of premises. That's a fallacy, uh, which is different from a falsehood. And a, a fallacious argument is the opposite of a valid argument, OK? Um, the key form of fallacy is a non sequitur, and it's a Latin term, and it just means it doesn't follow. Uh, no follow, doesn't follow. And uh, there are other forms of uh, fallacy. The arguments about uh, Harold here, that's equivocation, where you have a single uh, word such as difficult, uh, that's being used in two different senses. And the argument depends on these different meanings to come to the conclusion. Obviously, self-contradiction is a fallacy. Overgeneralization is one that's probably not unfamiliar too. But it's also a fallacy to have inappropriate appeal to authority. So if a law professor says that this is the law, how the law should be because I'm a legal expert, that's a fallacy because... Uh, his or her legal expertise does not validate or uh, make true the conclusion. Um, so um, you can find out more about uh, fallacies on my website, which can be accessed at davidstibel.info. I think it's 24. Yeah, 24.html. I have a little article on fallacies there that's written in fairly accessible English. Could you mention the ad hominem fallacy? The ad hominem fallacy is where you, uh, it's basically, it means against the person. So, for example, someone might say that uh, John Smith is a jerk, therefore what John says is false. That's a fallacy. Um, has a typical form of ad hominem, which is against the person, and it has nothing to do with whether the conclusion is true. Another common one, people say, Hitler is a vegetarian. That's an ad hominem fallacy. What's less known is that there's a positive form of the ad hominem fallacy, and the appeal to authority mentioned earlier is an instance of that, where you say, such and such is a wise person, therefore what such and such says is true doesn't follow. It's illogical. Um, so with criticism, there's two ways we can be critical. We can question the truth or falsehoods of statements, and as well, we can question how legitimate our inferences are. Those are the two modes of academic criticism. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, although I won't always belabor the point, but you have an idea of what's at work. Now, um, we're going to look at uh, intuitionism and some problems with it. It's an ubiquitous, it means it's everywhere kind of view in academic ethics. Um, and uh, for each of the philosophers I outlined last time, I suggest some intuitions that each one depends on to help make my point. There are problems with intuitionism or the method of saying that for any given ethical view, you can just express an intuition to review a statement that's not justified by any other statement. It's at the rock bottom of a theory. If it were justified by another statement, it would no longer be at the rock bottom or at the fundamental level. So intuitions, some people say that they're self-evidently true. Uh, skeptics, of course, would deny that. 
But an intuitionist says it's okay to assert intuitions, uh, these statements without any justification to get the argument going. And Kant here uh, intuits the idea that uh, Kant intuits the idea that if you can universalize the maxim of your action, that shows that the action, the type of action is ethical. So he's intuiting that, and he intuits always treat persons as ends in themselves and never as a means only. Believe me, you can universalize very different ideas than always treating people that way. Um, in general, some of the problems with this intuitionism is, well, first of all, they're not justified or evident. Uh, and many see that as inherently bad theory. Uh, indeed, they see it as an appeal to prejudice if there's no justification or evidence being offered. You could say that about Kant's intuitions here. You could say that intuitions jump to conclusions at the very beginning of an argument. Whatever Kant deduces from here, it looks like he's not jumping to conclusions because he's coming to his conclusions based on these ideas. But if you jump to those ideas at the very beginning, that's jumping to conclusions. Intuitions are indecisive because you can have all sorts of intuitions for all sorts of ethical theories, and the method of intuitionism does not va uh, validate or authenticate any particular intuition. It's a completely indecisive method. And you couldn't use intuition to settle a conflict between different intuitions because everyone would have different intuitions about how to settle that conflict. It would be hopelessly circular and inconclusive. Um, the other thing is that intuitions are irrationalist. They're not based on any reasoning, so it could lead to conflicts being resolved uh, not peaceably or even violently. Um, and the other thing is that uh, for animal rights ethicists who are complacent about using intuitions, and there are a great many of them, uh, I think that uh, they don't always are, are explicit about the fact that you can use intuitionism to justify anti-animal rights too. Not in the sense that intuitions are justified, but in the sense that intuitions can be used to justify oppressive practices. And we're going to look a little bit down the line when we discuss rights theories based on intuitionism explicitly, such as Regan. So let's look at uh, rights views. Immanuel Kant and Julian Franklin, who bases animal rights theory on Kant's general rights theory. Positive criticism about Kant. He, his theory opposes exploitation and hurting others. Uh, when you treat someone as a mere means, as he says, that's exploitation. His theory embodies the golden rule. Treat others as you would be treated, that is, with respect. That's in Kant's theory. It promotes consistency or coherency in ethic, which is a big deal. And it goes, it proposes an ethic that goes beyond mere cultural customs. We were talking later, I mean, sorry, earlier about uh, native peoples who rationalize uh, what we would call atrocities if they were committed against humans based on the fact that it's part of our culture. What about uh, negative criticism? Because we have to be fair to the old master. Uh, here's a big problem. You can universalize any set of rules, okay? Um, which means this is a problem of what I call invalidity. Remember we learned that uh, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises? Well, treating people always as ends in themselves and so on does not validly follow from universalizability. You could universalize utilitarianism, which Kant hated. You could universalize the ethic of care. You could universalize a tyranny where a tyrant universalizes that everyone give the tyrant special treatment. Um, the other thing is that not using someone as a mere means is very vague. Someone could say giving longer chains to a slave is not using the slave merely as a means, it's giving them some additional consideration, and that's just not good enough. It's too vague. 
Um, the other thing, and Paul's going to get into this more when he talks about Franklin's view, is that Kant's theory only respects rational beings, not sentient beings. And there's a lot of harm that's attached to that, a lot of violence. We talked last time about Kant's rules, never lie, never steal, and so on, as being too rigid because we thought of the case, uh, which is common to Kant discourse. What if the Nazis knock on your door? Do you lie to them about um, someone that you're harboring from them? Uh, the Rawlsians. Uh, I'm going to say that all the rights theories generally have very similar sorts of positive criticisms applied to them. They're all strongly protective of individuals. They promote fairness, consistency, and so on. So I'm not going to bore you by repeating my positive criticisms for every single rights theory. You're going to take for granted that all those positive criticisms apply to all the rights theories. So with respect to negative criticism for the Rawlsians, Again, from the original position, last time we saw that he postulates you're not born yet, you're a free spirit as part of this thought experiment, and you're going to frame rules of justice from this original position. You're going to have a veil of ignorance, so you don't know if you're going to be born dark-skinned or light-skinned, male or female, rich or poor, and so on. Uh, so you're going to come up with rules of justice that'll apply to you no matter how you're born with any of these differences. So ingeniously, uh, Rawls's theory, the blind justice figure uh, says a lot here, guarantees a kind of impartiality. But problematic is the fact that you can frame virtually any ethical theory from the original position, the ethic of care. You could even roll your dice with ethical egoism. Um, you could argue that those in the or original position are rational agents, and that rational agents can subscribe to ethical egoism, which we introduced last time, the ethics of self-interest. Um, others, Regan and Rollins, have pointed out uh, about that you could be born as an animal or a non-rational being, but all that depends on this fictional thought experiment. You know, how do we arrange our fictions? Um, if you say that it's unjust to exclude animals from the original position, to say that you can't be born as a non-human animal, well, unjust on this theory means what you can formulate from the original position. So it's not unjust to exclude animals on this theory because you can exclude animals from the original position. Therefore, it's not unjust. So you see, there's a lot of deep problems with Rawlsian theory. The Gawarthians run into problems of their own, despite uh, not just the intuitionism, which I criticized with uh, some seven or eight severe problems. And there's more. I'm abbreviating my critique for tonight. But with the uh, Gawarthians, you'll recall that they say that everyone needs freedom and well-being, or they cannot carry out their desires. And if everyone asserts to a right to freedom and well-being, they generalize these rights supposedly based on the principle of generic consistency, okay, uh, resulting in rights for all, they say. Well, one problem is that you can admit that you need welfare or freedom to realize any of your desires, but it's in no way necessary to assert rights to freedom or well-being. That really doesn't follow. That's something of a non sequitur, to use a term we introduced earlier. Also, um, the principle of generic consistency is problematic. As I said last time, it means being consistent about genera or kinds of things. But does that mean we should treat all objects that exist on the planet Earth in the same way? Obviously not. So... It's unclear at what level of abstraction or particularity to apply, excuse me, generic consistency. The other thing is, is that an ethical nihilist, last time we learned uh, they think that nothing is absolutely binding, that there's nothing to guide us. An ethical nihilist can be consistent, uh, but consistently inconsistent. That is consistently arbitrary in his or her response to all situations. And that makes nonsense of ethics based on uh, generic consistency. 
Um, the other thing is, is that we don't always need to be consistent. If you go to a lovely vegan restaurant and they have a mouth-watering array of uh, chocolate fudge cake and blueberry pie and phaco jello, and you can dream up a few other goodies right now. But uh, you don't have to be consistent over your lifetime with how you choose your desserts. So, you know, consistency isn't always even applicable, as is being implied here, that we always have to be consistent. Um, Another severe problem with the, the Rawlsians is that uh, you'll notice that the theory is saying that for implementing any desires whatsoever, you need freedom and well-being. Well, ladies and gentlemen, any desires whatsoever is highly nihilistic. Any desires whatsoever includes desires to do violence, for example. So the theory in what it's aiming to facilitate, any desires whatsoever, is rather nihilistic and would not create a kind of moral psychology. It would create a kind of nihilistic sort of pursuit of ends. And anyone starting with that sort of idea, they wouldn't necessarily care about much of anything, including generic consistency. Um, so there, this theory focuses too much on means. Oh, sorry. This theory focuses too much on means, that we need freedom, we need well-being as means to carrying out our desires, or part of our means, right? But it doesn't focus enough on ends if it says, well, let's just aim for any desires whatsoever. Let's think about that. What does it mean? Something that's not necessarily appealing. So this applies not only to Gore's theory, but to Pluhar's theory, which is entirely and explicitly based on Gore's. What about Tom Regan's theory? He's an intuitionist, and I've spelled them out for you tonight, some of the major ones. He intuits inherent value of subjects of a life, that they have equal inherent value, the respect principle, the harm principle. He has principles for dealing with hard cases. These are intuitive. Um, all the critiques of intuitionism voiced earlier apply. The notes for this talk, like the notes for the previous talk, are available online. So if you're finding any of this hard going, you're able to listen to it as many times as you can afford to uh, or see the explicit notes to aid your understanding. But I'm going to try to get through to you as best I can right here and right now. So these are intuitions. Um, Again, very strong rights, lots that's wonderful about this and other rights theories, right? Regan opposes utilitarian vivisection and what he calls uh, environmental fascism, which we'll touch on a bit later. And uh, delightfully, uh, you're, you're lecturing on that later, aren't you, Paul? Yeah, we cover that in the picture. So that's great and something to look forward to. Some negative criticism of Regan, and please keep in mind that when I say negative criticism, I'm not being negative. I'm not someone who likes negativity. I'm looking to arguments that are purported to be adequate academically, and I'm looking at them objectively. What's positive and what's negative about these assertions and arguments, okay? Um, I, I'm certainly not negative about any of the people um, that I'm presenting on tonight. Uh, this is all impersonal. It's all at the level of issues and assertions and arguments. Why not give rights just to sentient beings? Because Regan gives rights to subjects of a life. <coughs> in the case for animal rights, which was published in 1983, Regan intuits about 10 characteristics. He says that subjects of a life have, and I quote, beliefs and desires, perception, memory, and a sense of the future, including their own future, an emotional life together with feelings of pleasure and pain, preference and welfare interests. This is a lot of stuff. The ability to initiate action in pursuit of their desires and goals, a psychophysical identity over time, won't detain us here, and an individual welfare in the sense that their experiential life fares well or ill for them, logically independently of their utility for others, and logically independently of their being the object of anyone's interest. Obviously, uh, the level at which I'm speaking generally tonight 
I'm trying not to be quite so abstruse as this quotation itself. But the quotation includes things like the, to have rights, the animal has to have a memory. The animal has to have a sense of the future and the ability to initiate action in pursuit of their uh, desires and goals. Well, my grandmother, before she died, didn't have much of a memory. Uh, it was unclear how much of a sense of the future she had. And uh, she, her ability to pursue goals was limited. So should she have fewer rights or no rights? This is problematic. Um, uh, and so I'm in accord with other animal rights theorists who say that sentience is an adequate and less discriminatory criterion of moral standing. Remember last time, moral standing is moral status, having some kind of moral respect according to whatever theory, rights, utilitarianism, and so on. Yes, Michael. Sorry, the question was, can you explain sentience? An excellent question. Peter Singer in Animal Liberation defines sentience as the ability to feel pleasure or pain. Last time I indicated with respect to sentience that that's too narrow, that obvious, uh, um, at times you have theorists emphasizing feelings, one part of affect, and at other times you have theorists emphasizing des desires and relatedly preferences or will. Uh, Joel Feinberg emphasizes what he, uh, desires. Um, to me, sentience should unite these two families of affect and include feelings and de desires, which extends to preferences as well. So being sentient means being conscious in such a way that you have affect, i.e. feelings and desires, according to what I'm uh, communicating to you tonight anyway. So Regan um, intuits the respect principle from inherent value of subjects of a life. But respect can mean anything, ladies and gentlemen. Respect can lead to any of the moral theories that we've talked about. Again, it's completely ambiguous, and therefore it's logically weak. Uh, I in indicated last time that he said that you could choose to save humans over non-humans in a lifeboat because the human supposedly has more opportunities for satisfaction than the dog. Um, does that mean you would save a rich person over a poor person because the rich people would have more opportunities for satisfaction? There's problems here. I'm not going to elaborate. The other thing is he says there's equal inherent value for all subjects of a life. But the quote I just read to you, you can have degrees pretty much of all the characteristics. You can have beliefs to degrees, memories, anticipations, uh, uh, goal-directed activity, and so on. So it doesn't self-evidently follow this equality that he's asserting and that I'm wholly sympathetic to, but logically uh, in a position that I have to doubt it. As for Francione, you can see some of his intuitions that humans have an interest in not being treated as property. Uh, he intuits the principle of equal consideration of interests, um, avoiding unnecessary suffering, and so on. Um, negative criticism. Um, he's associating, remember from last time, that to him, there is only one right that animals have. Excuse me. And that is the right not to be considered or treated as property. Now, logically, that implies that being property is always a negative thing. If you have the right not to be considered something, it must be a bad thing. But uh, he's completely negativist about the institution of property. Now, let's be 100% clear here. Um, as an animal liberationist, I argue for the abolition of the property status for animals as soon as possible. Are we clear on that? Good. Um, but what I'm indicating here, too, is that there's a long road before we get to abolition. And along that road, people have used concepts such as responsible ownership uh, for speciesist frameworks. Speciesists are not always moved by animal rights arguments such as these intuitionist wonders of the modern day. And so sometimes we have to appeal to speciesists to at least treat animals better if they're not going to liberate them. 
And responsible ownership is a way of trying to get people to take care of their animal companions, for example. And to say that we should slash that out just so we can have Francione's theory seems like a heavy price to pay. I think we should legislate what responsible ownership means as on the way to liberation, because it's a long road to liberation. The other thing is that a vegan who owns an animal uh, doesn't have all the negative things that Francione associates with uh, property status. He associates implicitly because he has poor analysis of property status in his work in the impartial sense that you can't zero in on a part of his work where he says, here's my analysis of property status. Here's exactly what I mean. No, commentators such as myself have to go through his whole work and kind of piece together from fragments what he means by property status. So he means negative things, presumably, such as treating animals as objects, which he mentions in connection, obviously ownership, uh, treating animals as a means or a resource or an instrument or a tool or a slave, right? Those are all associated. But the vegan who owns an animal is not engaged in any of those negative things. So once again, it's a false overgeneralization, his concept of property status. Um, and the vegan can even use ownership of the animal in the interest of the animal. If I've got my, in quotation marks, uh, kitty at the vet, I can use that legal relationship to insist on proper care for that animal if there's a negligent vet who might uh, veer otherwise or something, right? So it could be have a positive use. Um, Francione is obviously overly negative about property status of animals. At least it seems obvious to me. Perhaps you think that I'm naive. Another objection is that there might be a native hunter, hunts animals down, kills them, but then he runs across, um, let's say, Francione's arguments against speciesism or someone's arguments against speciesism, and he thinks, I don't want to hunt anymore. This is speciesism. This is wrong. This is like racism against me. So the person might stop hunting animals, but the native might never have had any conception of property status of animals to begin with. I studied anthropology as my minor for my Bachelor of Arts degree. And uh, Richard Lee, an anthropologist here at the university, said that when one uh, European fellow, hey there, buddy, wanted to buy land from um, a native person, the native person responded by offering the guy a bucket of soil. The native person was not unintelligent or anything of the sort. It's just that he, he didn't have any concept of owning land. It wasn't, it's not part of his cultural heritage or repertoire, right? So it's very interesting. Um, and a lot of natives would think it's a horrible idea that anyone could own land or nature that we all share. So, you know, Francione's theory is completely inapplicable. And in fact, it's what in anthropology we call ethnocentric, being overly centered in your own culture so much that you can't even see or register what's happening in other cultures. The other problem is that property status is not the root of the problem. Speciesism is. And although property status isn't always associated with bad things, speciesism is. And so is racism. And Speciesism isn't even the root thing. Things like exploitive interests leading to indifference uh, and abuse and neglect, that is one of the causes of speciesism. Let's go to the root here. Um, let's see. The other thing, you'll recall the quote from last time. He says, uh, we don't need Regan's complicated rights theory because I can derive uh, the right not to be considered property directly from the principle of equal consideration. Well, um, but utilitarianism also uses the principle of equal consideration. Let's convey what the principle of equal consideration means in Francione's terms uh, from his book, Introduction to Animal Rights. It means treating like things alike and different things differently unless you have a good reason to do otherwise. Well, guess what? Utilitarians treat all things like things alike and different things differently. And on their account, they have ideas of good and bad reasons to treat things differently. It's ludicrous to say that you can derive the right not to be considered property, as poor a right as that is, 
just from the principle of equal consideration because all the ethical theories use the principle of equal consideration. Um, he says that his view rests comfortably on two intuitions, but I would be uncomfortable if I wrote this myself. He says that avoiding unnecessary suffering and allowing humans to be preferred in cases of necessity, he's not necessarily saying he would, but he says, let's allow this for the sake of argument. Uh, but the problem is that um, avoiding unnecessary suffering and allowing preferring humans that can rationalize medical vivisection, uh, experimenting on animals to find cures and treatments. So there's a problem. 